at it again. Okay. This is a veteran interview with Bob Spitzy uh, for the Veteran History Project in Studio X of Campbell Hall for WILL TV on October 9th, 2007, uh, conducted by Jesse Phillippe. Okay. Um, let's start off uh, by asking, were you aware of the war that was, that was already going on overseas before Pearl Harbor was attacked? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, aware of it in fact, but also mm -hmm. my family has been intru intruded by wars as far back as we know. Okay. And so I, I'd heard it from my family and my dad was in World War I and slugged out the trenches of, of France. And so we were quite aware of what was going on. Okay. Um, how did you find out about it? Through what news sources? Um, uh, I was a, a fairly avid reader of uh, newspaper. Okay. Uh, we didn't have TV, of course, um, and radio wasn't a, a common source of information, so I used uh, okay. the newspaper. Okay. Um, what was the general feeling of whether or not uh, the U.S. should get involved in the war? In, <coughs> I'm sure it varied by different areas of the country. Right. In, in my area, I was at a university town, mm -hmm. uh, which I think was a little different than the surrounding community. I think it was considerable pessimism and apprehension okay. about the war. Okay. Uh, and I think that prevailed in almost all communities. Uh, very reasonably so. We, we, were, we were a nation that had withdrawn from the world, essentially, between the wars. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to be left alone. That was our culture. and. Our key political leaders, regardless of how, how popular they were, had to be essentially against the war uh, in order to get elected. That was how I, th I feel. I think we felt. I was simply a part of that. Mm -hmm. So you agreed then, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, then when, when and how uh, did you join or get involved in the armed forces? Uh, as uh, the situation continued. Uh, of course, I can still remember where I was sitting uh, uh, when I heard Pearl Harbor. Uh, we got at seeing some of my best friends march down the street uh, in the National Guard. I became very much personally more aware of it and talked to my father a great deal about it. Uh, had some real conscience uh, problems uh, as to whether I should wanted to be involved. Mm -hmm. And I resolved those uh, satisfactorily that uh, this was what I needed to do like my father and all my ancestors had done so I would I would do the best I could and uh, and serve uh, in the most honorable way I could so from then on it was how I evolved and I decided to go into the Navy and stay in the Army perhaps uh, because of my dear father he said Robert uh, the Navy at least has a place for you to sleep every night mm -hmm. I'll never forget those words okay and so farm boy from the Midwest, I looked at Navy. Okay. Even though I'd been in ROTC, uh, early college, mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I joined the, the Naval and then it was a matter of when they would call us up. So I got through my junior year in college and that was time for me to report. Okay, so how, how old were you at the time? Uh, it was in 1943, uh, so I was 21. Okay, um, so you went to the Navy. Um, how did you feel when you said goodbye to your family, um, you know, left home and went into the military? Uh, certainly mixed feelings. Uh, there was a degree of, of sadness and loneliness as uh, uh, I was engaged to a, a marvelous uh, companion that I'd uh, learned and got acquainted with in college. Uh, we were engaged, but we were going to wait until after the war uh, for marriage, uh, and I, it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. Good, difficult to say goodbye to my family. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there was always a, a sense of, of anticipation. There was something new coming along that I had never experienced. And I've always been one open, welcome to, to new ideas. And so I, it was a mixed uh, kind of feeling. I was going to make the best of it. And I soon sensed that it was the most broadening experience I'd ever experienced, I'd ever had. And I couldn't anticipate how broadening it was. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I got involved in it, uh, the sadness was replaced somewhat by the day-to-day -day commitment 
and the duty that you felt you would just do things and we did them. Mm -hmm. Always kept a close contact, of course, with my family, my, my uh, fiance, but uh, uh, it went along pretty fast. Oh, okay. So you hadn't gotten married before the no. war? Okay. No, we were just no. engaged. Okay. Uh, uh, gave her the ring and uh, we made the commitment to her father and, and so forth. But then we made a commitment to each other that we would each do the best we could. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we'd write every day, which okay. we did. You right. Never missed a day. Okay. Uh, in the Navy, that means you get a pile of letters some, some days, mm -hmm. and then you won't get anything for two or three months. Right. And I expect she got the same thing. Okay. Um, what was it like going from civilian life to military life? Uh, it was an adjustment, but mine came... Uh, a little slower because uh, in in those days all students in land grant colleges had to go into ROTC or in ROTC one of them. We had ROTC on my campus and so uh, I was forced essentially to take that which I took as simply a matter of course like physical education or something so I became uh, being identified with and became acquainted with uh, a military kind of a structure uh, and, and all that goes with it mm -hmm. um, before I actually got in the Navy. So right. I'd had two years of that uh, before, well, actually almost three years of that before I got into to the Naval, mm -hmm. Navy. But there was adjustment. There okay. was an adjustment. It wasn't too difficult for me. I, I haven't been a particularly rebellious person. I'm quite independent, but I, I, I'm, I, I'm able to adapt whatever the situation is, and I, I find that very useful because I came into situations in the Navy, if I hadn't adapted, why I'd been washed out. Okay. You have to learn to, to take it okay. on the chin. So, um, being that you uh, were in ROTC, did you uh, go, like, were you an officer when you enlisted, or, um, did, or did you have to, like, go through more training? And, like, uh, uh, much more training. Okay. Uh, ROTC has two levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, in those days, so the first two years uh, was for everybody, all students, okay. and then if you wanted to uh, get more specialization, actually get a commission, you would take two more years. Oh, okay. I had chosen by the end of my second year, I was going in the Navy instead of the Army, mm -hmm. so I did not go into the upper divisions of ROTC. Oh, okay. So then I, I, now I was in the, in the uh, stream to become an officer in the Naval Reserve. Okay. Uh, and so I. I trained at two different universities, one in Ar a college in southern Arkansas, Arkansas is my home area, University of Arkansas is my home school, mm -hmm. and Arkansas A&M, a little school in the southern part of the state became a training ground for us, so we spent four months there. And then uh, I was shipped to Columbia University of all places in New York City, center of New York City. Now I get the contrast, a farm boy from the Ozarks, but didn't find yourself in an institution in the middle of one of the greatest cities of the world. Mm -hmm. And I found it both challenging, a little bewildering, but tremendously informative and awakening. So in training at Columbia University for four months, uh, did a pretty good job, got honors, so to speak, uh, as, a, as a graduate. Mm -hmm. Actually got my commission in the Cathedral, cathedral St. John the Divine in New York City, the great institution. That's where, that's where I was commissioned. And, uh, and then got a, a short furlough uh, mm -hmm. with my commission, Ensign, Ensign Commission, and uh, went back home. And that's when uh, my dearest and I decided we'd rather spend the rest of the war married than not. And so we, we had a short uh, a period of preparing, a wonderful wedding of people who were still around, mm -hmm. uh, three or four days, honeymoon, and, and then we parted company. Okay. Um, what uh, what kinds of things did they they teach you in the Navy? Uh, in all the services, the first thing is discipline. Mm -hmm. You learn to take an order and carry it out, whether you agree or disagree. A little different than university life. A little different than the life we live as civilians. So that was the first thing, and many people mm -hmm. could not do that, and they had great difficulty. Uh, I found it. Uh, harsh and, mm -hmm. and objectionable, but I, I adapted to it. Uh, so that's the first thing. But secondly, uh, uh, you, you further your skills. 
I took mathematics, I took so social science, political science, uh, war history, you name it, a whole gamut of, of, of very rigorous uh, subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and then always the drill, 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 drill. Yeah. Learn to stand there and take the guff, whatever, because you've got to conform, you've got to conform. So that, that's a part of all the service. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a part of, of the officer training. And then finally we got into to more specific things of, of uh, leadership, a lot of leadership training, uh, and uh, how, how you take command of, of, of vessels, uh, or if you're a communication officer, how you're in charge of that. And so you get a more specialized subjects, but you do all this in what they call a 90 day wonder. I mean, we had to turn these people out in a very hurry. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as long as you did your job and worked hard, which I did, I enjoyed New York City and benefited tremendously from the culture there, but you worked hard. If you do your job, uh, then you come out passing muster, so to speak. You get the commission, and then you start having to take responsibility and put the fat practice of the things that you had learned. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. Um, so you served in the Navy. So uh, which ship did you serve on? I served on on two ships, okay. and by the time I got in, it, uh, we were primarily in the Pacific end of the war. I just missed the Atlantic. Uh, mm -hmm. Not too sad, but I would have done my best if we had. So uh, a great deal of the Western, uh, the Pacific War was an amphibious war. Uh, hip, uh, skipping from island to island, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> so I served on two kinds of amphibious ships, the biggest of them called landing ship tank. Mm -hmm. uh, they were designed as a big tub to transport uh, not only troops but also equipment, trucks, tanks, mm -hmm. all the other gear that goes along the war within this huge uh, uh, tub of a thing. Um, and I served on one for a few months, USS 730, and it was a training ship in the uh, Chesapeake area uh, and learned uh, the goings on of, of ship life, and we actually helped train other crews. But then they were forming new crews to take the ships into the Western Pacific. And so I became a part of a crew, uh, which we formed and trained together at a, a camp, Camp Bradford in, in Virginia. And then when our ship became available, uh, we transported right back here to Illinois, uh, where they were building these LSTs on the Illinois River at Seneca, mm -hmm. up here in uh, central Illinois. Uh, Chicago Iron and Steel Company was uh, hired to just come out and essentially build a, a, an assembly line on this river. They turned out these ships probably once a, a week, I suspect huge production process. Mm -hmm. So our ship uh, was ready to be launched, LST-642, and uh, I and the other crew, and actually our spouses came for the launching of it. Mm -hmm. We got to see it dump into the, into the Illinois River. We got on it with our crew of about 90 uh, uh, classes of, of, of uh, non-commissioned people. Mm -hmm. uh, we got on a ship, uh, rode it down the Illinois River, uh, onto the Mississippi River, down to New Orleans, outfitted it there, and uh, and then from then on it was getting ready for the, the Western experience. So we went through the Panama Canal up the Western course, co Coast, uh, took it out to Hawaii, did some training, some uh, some mock invasions around the Hawaiian Islands, and then we were uh, headed on. And by the time we got there, the Marshall Islands and the Mariana Islands were already secured, uh, they were b being used as a staging area for the rest of the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our first preparation and engagement was Iwo Jima. And that was uh, quite an experience, obviously, and one that you really sense what, uh, how terrible war is and what it can and cannot do. But that was, uh, that was our first experience. Okay. Um, what was it like on board the LST? Board, or the LST? Well, uh, it was certainly livable. Mm -hmm. As my dad had warned, you'll have a place to eat and sleep, and you do. And as long as you're, you're cruising across the Pacific, it's a fairly 
nice existence. Mm -hmm. um, they're comfortable ships, obviously more comfortable for officers who we had a stateroom mm -hmm. on the main deck, whereas the crew uh, of various levels of the crew had different kinds of accommodations down in the hold. And I'm sure uh, their, their comfort was about near what ours was. I'm sure they, they had good food but certainly they did not have the amenities that officers did. Mm -hmm. And there is always perks that goes along with officers and all military. That's a part of, of you, you accept this, mm -hmm. you, and you're either a part of it or you aren't a part of it. So uh, the daily life uh, was challenging. We were learning. Mm -hmm. uh, we felt responsible. Uh, we enjoyed camaraderie. Uh, and we were always aware that things would be getting worse because we were getting closer and closer to the point of engagement and you start taking the life a lot more seriously. Uh, I'll never forget uh, the last time we, the last night we were in Hawaii, uh, I was in charge, I, I was a communication officer, that was my role, to be in charge of all the communication ship. We had about seven or eight officers in charge of different parts of the ship, mm -hmm. commanding officer, executive officer, and then five of us uh, was a different section. And uh, my, uh, my key radio man wanted to go out and see some of Honolulu the last night, and. <laughs> I uh, probably unwisely said yes, um, and uh, we weren't quite ready the next morning to carry out communications like we should, and, and we actually had uh, a, a big commander on our ship, and uh, I'm sure he was watching me all night long to see whether I would really miss anything that he could say, this, this, this officer's not ready for, because I had made that decision. Mm -hmm. But the young man worked all night and got the equipment going, and so we were ready to go the next morning, but mm -hmm. there's some kind of things you face. Yeah. <laughs> um, what were, we've already talked about some of the locations that you, some of the locations that you served in, like Iwo Jima. Uh, just, just tell me about some of the locations that you served in. Well, after, after Iwo Jima, uh, our, our job was to deliver, uh, deliver Marines onto the beach, which we did uh, mm -hmm. the morning of the invasion. Never forget that, of course. Um, and uh, th then we had a lot of equipment, so it took us se several days to get that uh, disgorged onto the, the beach. Um, and uh, then our job was to retract and go back and get additional supplies mm -hmm. back to the staging area, which we did. Um, so I, I was able to to see the tragedy of the Iwo Jima invasion, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the flag going up and all of that stuff. Uh, but one of the most telling things I, I must I must share. Uh, we we had uh, a couple of hundred Marines uh, on the ship, uh, getting ready to go in, and so each of us officers in the stateroom we had another. Uh, a Marine officer uh, bed uh, in the same room, and I got quite well acquainted with a lieutenant uh, from the east in the Marines. Uh, the name was Harvey, and uh, I'll never forget the morning of the invasion. He uh, he came and he said, uh, "Well, Bob, you know I may not make it through. Uh, here's my wife's uh, name and address. Would you please let her know?" Well. Anything, you know, if you know anything about Iwo Jima, not many people survived that onslaught. Right. It was a terrible, terrible slaughter. Yeah. And so he was gone after the second day. Mm -hmm. uh, we were informed about it, and one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life was to uh, write a letter to his wife. Mm -hmm. So uh, after Iwo Jima, we uh, then were getting ready for Okinawa, which was the next big engagement. Mm -hmm. So we went in Okinawa, went through the whole process again. It was a much longer, more protracted invasion than Iwo Jima. That was the la kind of the last big stand off the mainland. Mm -hmm. uh, the very fiercely fought a war. Again, our job was to take in troops, take in supplies, uh, which we did, and we got along pretty well doing our job. Uh, the suicide bombers were coming in, fighters were coming in by that time. Fortunately, we were spared that. Uh, but I had a, a lot of ex experiences of, of, of how, you, how you carry on this kind of a terrible tragedy and, and the effects of it mm -hmm. and, and still maintain your sanity and yeah. so forth. 
uh, we then immediately were getting back in the Philippines. By that time, the Philippines had been secured. We were now using the Philippines as a stage and getting ready to go into Japan. So we were pretty well along uh, preparation to land. We had the pontoons on the side of the ship, which are used to, to bridge the gap between uh, the doors onto the beach, not knowing for sure what you're going to. So we had those on. Uh, we were in training, and when, of course, we got the news of the end of the war, it was uh, it was a celebrated occasion. Yeah. Uh, quick, quick, a little anecdote on that. Uh, we were always always in formation. You, you, you had since we had no very little protection. We had submarines mm -hmm. and destroyers around us protecting our uh, huge uh, flotilla of LSTs and other amphibious ships. And so we were floating along between uh, somewhere around the area of Philippines and and uh, Japan. And uh, in a, uh, the news came through that the war was over. And we had a, a little bit of a maverick of a, of a uh, captain, uh, interesting guy, uh, kind of enjoyed him, but he was real maverick. So he immediately uh, told me as a communication officer, tell the helmsman to turn toward the uh, United States. And so the helmsman swinged the ship around right in the middle of a big formation. And the commander of the flotilla immediately, what are your intentions? And our captain floated, we're heading home. He said, I suggest you get back in formation, sir. So, of course, a little addict to the thing of war. Mm -hmm. So, uh, obviously, we could get back. And it was a long time before we started home, but uh, that was an immediate reaction. You just didn't want to get home, you want to get out of this. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I don't think he was, uh, he, he was reprimanded for that, but uh, it was, it, I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. um, were there any dangers of your work other, other than battle related dangers, like on the ship? Well, health. There was always health problems. Yeah, health uh, you had to be watchful of that. Mm -hmm. We didn't have much trouble. We actually had one officer we had to put ashore because of seasickness. Mm -hmm. Seasickness is an interesting uh, psychological phenomenon. Most mm -hmm. of us can adapt to it. We, uh, almost all of us get sick. As soon as, as soon as you get on a ship in the ocean, you'll get sick. Mm -hmm. But then you get over it, and, and you're good. And so we all of us went through that. But we had one officer who simply could not get well. And so we had to put him on, he would have died, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we had sickness, of yeah. course, and, and quite good medical care because we had uh, uh, corpsmen uh, trained uh, as, as non-doctors, but trained as parapodic on the ship. But then we'd get to shore where we'd get treatment uh, mm -hmm. to, to take care of. Uh, so it was primarily uh, war-related, uh, mm -hmm. and it got... Uh, on invasions, you, uh, when you're in the ocean in war, you're always subject to, to enemy submarines. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that time, there weren't, wasn't too much enemy aircraft, but there were some around. But then at the invasion time, there were enemy aircraft. Uh, and then in the latter part of the war, the suicide bombers, they would just come in and head right into a ship mm -hmm. in order to, to explode it. Fortunately, the LST was not that good a target, they'd much rather get a battleship or mm -hmm. a carrier. So, but there were some LSTs were were hit by suicide bombers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, weather, uh, you're you're at the you're subject to the whims of, of weather. Uh, when the Pacific Ocean is calm, it's a beautiful place to be. When it's furious, it's a terrible place to be. Mm -hmm. So we were caught in one typhoon, essentially between. Uh, Saipan, the Philippines, and and uh, uh, Okinawa. Uh, weather, I suppose, predictions were only casual. I, I, it looks to me like we should have avoided it, but we just found ourselves right in the middle of a terrible typhoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, all, you, all we did was just held on. We couldn't guide the ship, you couldn't do anything. Just, just floated around, mm -hmm. bounced around, huge waves, all sick, of course. Finally, uh, it was over. And our ship did not go down, but there were some ships lost in, in those terrible weather-related uh, mm -hmm. accidents. Okay. Um, Sorry I digress, but uh, <laughs> the memories are very vivid. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so then you were actually, were you, were you in combat on Iwo Jima? Like Iwo Jima with Okinawa. Okinawa, yes. Okay. And, and we're getting ready to be in Japan, which uh, mm -hmm. most of us are quite sure would have been one of the most terrible 
invasions mm -hmm. the world's ever seen because of ferociousness mm -hmm. and the particular ideology of the Japanese. Right. It would have been a, a tragic fight, I'm sure, but I expect we would have prevailed like we did in Europe. Uh, 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 were were you ever wounded at all? No, okay. fortunately. Good. Uh, we our ship never came under direct fire. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, many LSTs did. They were uh, they were hit by uh, one one good hit with a with a uh, barter shell that would be over with. Or of course, if a Japanese would happen to take it over, they would normally not go after us. Mm -hmm. No, I came out unscathed uh, physically, mm -hmm. uh, mentally much wiser, much more mature. You mature rather fast. Mm -hmm. As I look back on it, I think uh, age of 21 to 23 uh, made tremendous changes. Much more uh, informed person, mm -hmm. much more experienced, much more a sense of now a person of the world, not just of a, a, a state in the United States. And the sense that we are a part of a, of a global community gradually, I think, came over many of us. And that was one of, one of the periods of euphoria for me and I think many other veterans. Uh, we knew war could not be the only answer to human existence, but what you do about it. And uh, we were aware that there was talk about the United Nations right when the war was going on. The last year of the war, there was a lot of efforts made and what was interesting, the, the very month of the invasion of Iwo Jima, probably the very day, uh, our president and the other uh, coalition leaders were meeting, uh, making plans for the first international conference, which was held in San Francisco the latter part of that month mm -hmm. to launch the United Nations, uh, which was one, I think, one of the great human visions that the world's ever known. Mm -hmm. um, and it brought a lot of hope to many of us. Surely this is a better way to go. And we were proud that we were part of a country that would give leadership to that, that would respect it, and sense that war can't be the answer. Mm -hmm. It's not the first answer. It, it, it's, as, as Secretary General of the United Nations said, the previous one he had, Copiano, is one of the great ones, I think. He didn't get to accomplish very much because of, of what has been going on the last five years. But he said, war has to be the last resort, not the first resort. Mm -hmm. It's so true. So that uh, uh, we, we sense that we're, we're maybe we're ushering in a period when our children, our grandchildren, will not have to go to war. Like everyone in my generation, I can go back as far as I know, every generation had to, to fight the war. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I'd say the period of the 60s and 70s were, were a period of euphoria for a lot of the Americans, particularly those of experience no war, mm -hmm. that, that surely we're on a course of something different. A lot to be done, a lot of problems, but it's a lot better than the alternative. And we sensed that the world was undergoing tremendous change. That euphoria has given way to a great deal of sadness, sorrow, and, and I, I'd say a disillusionment to many of us in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, we've gotten off course, and uh, the thought that we might allow ourselves to be engaged in another uh, international engagement goes on for years and years is, is unthinkable, but yet that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. uh, do you remember in, in battle, do you remember any uh, sights, sounds, smells, or sensations that were particularly uh, that stood out particularly? Uh, any what? I didn't get the word. Any sights, smells, sounds, or sensations that stood out particularly in, in battle? And, or well, uh, uh, certainly uh, the tremendous sights and sound of invasion mm -hmm. cannot be forgotten. Yeah. Uh, uh, battleships behind you lopping over the tr most powerful bombs at that time onto this little island mm -hmm. and, and see an island just completely cleared of all known humans and vegetations through that process. Mm 
is, is, a, is a sight to behold and a sight to, to be respectful of and be wary of, obviously, of the tremendous destruction. And then we were involved um, in, in ferrying troops into Japan for several months, taking supplies into the, the uh, uh, forces that were occupying Japan. And as soon as we got into Yokohama Harbor, I'll never forget, uh, they had one train running between the shipyard and downtown, uh, through Yokohama downtown Tokyo. And to see that tremendous urban community completely devastated, essentially nothing standing, nothing. Mm -hmm. It was hard to imagine it could happen. Until we got into the center of Tokyo and there we found the Imperial Palace area was, was unscathed. And of course, that was deliberate. Uh, it was not bombed, it was not destroyed to try to, to see if we could engage the, the Japanese uh, to surrender through, through that sort of process. Um, but uh, to, 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 to see the devastation that can happen uh, is, is awesome. I've been back to Japan since then. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what we human beings can do. One of the most modern, efficient, tremendous cities of the world. You think, I, I've seen those two. One of them is what the human being can destroy. The other is what the human being can, can construct and can build. And we as people and societies have choices. And if we understand enough about it, surely we'll make rational choices. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I, I, I'm so glad that, that we had this great war series. I think it helps maybe a lot of people today that have no idea of what a, a devastating war can do Mm -hmm. because we've been spared it by and large in this country uh, and now they at least had a chance to learn about it. Um, so that, that certainly is a sight and a sound I'll never forget. Yeah. What, what were the worst moments that you were witness to that you remember? Well I've, I've alluded uh, to them, uh, mm -hmm. uh, certainly departing my loved ones, my family, it was mm -hmm. a terrible moment for me. Um, the typhoon was a terrifying experience mm -hmm. of a different kind. Uh, then the invasion itself right. was a, a terrifying experience. Okay. And then to see the destruction afterwards, each one of those is just deadly in my mind. I can, mm -hmm. I, I could, if I were a painter, I could paint pictures of them uh, okay. daily. I'll, I'll never forget them. Okay. Uh, the, the, the human tragedy of having your friend killed, we didn't have that so much in the Navy, you mm -hmm. see. Uh, fortunately, I say, but the closest I had was this friend, uh, the Marine, who I had bid goodbye that morning and he would never breathe again. Uh, that was, well, if you're in the Marines or the Army, you experience that all the time. Mm -hmm. We in the Navy, it's to see a ship hit and know what's going on there, mm -hmm. or, or to feel the fury of, of weather, uh, something like that. Yeah. I had some tragedies of crew going down to Mississippi. Uh, we had one crewman uh, that decided he couldn't take it, so he tried to swim. We, we'd dock, we would uh, uh, anchor every night at the Mississippi River for safety. And so we were anchored down uh, somewhere around Louisiana last night before we got in New Orleans. And he decided he'd make a swim for it. Uh, so he jumped ship. And uh, we knew the next morning he wasn't on board. Uh, and then we, as a communication officer, uh, I got a message that a body had been found floating near us. And we had to identify him as, as our, one of our sailors. Mm -hmm. Had made a poor decision, but it was kind of a tragic thing to think that the young man didn't have to do that. Maybe, who knows, it's better that way, but. It was a tragedy, mm -hmm. and what it was, we felt very, very keenly about. Yeah. Um, was, was the war a chaotic time for you? Kind of. Did, was there a it, feeling of chaos? It was. A, it was chaotic in terms of, of surroundings, in terms of, of my personal life and existence. It was not so chaotic. Okay. I was able to I was able to see Arger. I was able to bring Arger into it, and uh, so I did not have you might say the psychological impact that that some chaos did in others. 
on the way back, I'll never forget that, when we were finally discharged in, in Manila and I got on a, a, a carrier to come back to the United States, I had about a week or two just floating along, uh, in pure luxury, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I spent that time endless hours, completely alone, essentially, trying to start out the rest of my life, what I wanted to do when I came back home. Mm -hmm. Obviously joined my, my uh, bride and, and trying to make some sense out of our lives. But what I wanted to do with my life. So I can still remember walking this night, the beautiful uh, moonlight of the Pacific Ocean, trying to figure out just what do I want to do. And I, I had to sort it out. I had numerous options. I had values I wanted to express. Uh, I knew I wanted to continue education. I felt like that that, that was a place that I, I, I could develop myself and I could also help others. But as to what part of it, and uh, it was it was a... A, a, um, it was a challenging period, mm -hmm. and it took me another uh, year or two after I got back and continued school before I was able to start exactly what I wanted to do as a career, which finally came, and then from then on, it's, it's been gravy. I mean, it's just uh, my professional life has been one of, of great ecstasy and joy my wife and I both had uh, as I found what I wanted to do, and I was able to do something I thought was worthwhile and accomplish it, and I still revel in that. Um, what did you believe um, was at stake in the war at the time? What, what uh, I, 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 th I think I understood pretty well what the world was up against. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to carefully use my words. We found in World War II, leading up to it, that an economic system can be extremely useful or can be completely, completely, terribly destructive of the human being. And so uh, capitalism was gone a buck. It had gone a buck in Japan, it had gone a buck in Germany, in mm -hmm. Italy. Uh, pure capitalism, which is people who use the power of the market system in a completely uncontrolled way mm -hmm to achieve their ends, which is control. And that coupled with very little or no democratic government, obviously there's a government, but it's a dictatorial government, that combination of uncontrolled, uh, unregulated un, uh, capitalism mm -hmm. coupled with military, coupled with dictatorship is a tremendously lethal thing and it has sought tragedy in this world throughout. So I understood that, that was going on mm -hmm. uh, and it has affected the way I've tried to deal with my own understanding of economics, mm -hmm. of public policy making, of government. Uh, and uh, I think that that we've got to continually remind ourselves of that. We got to understand what it is that we're talking about. We talk about economic systems, we talk about political systems. Mm -hmm. I personally am very strongly uh, respectful of democracy. I don't think there's a better way to organize ourselves and resolve our conflicts. Uh, I think that some kind of a market system is one of the best ways, but it cannot be an uncontrolled market because a market system uncontrolled is, is vicious. Mm -hmm. But the combination of a democracy and a market system can be tremendously powerful forces, and I think are showing that they can now, particularly in Europe, uh, who has taken an entirely different turn they did for 400 years. They are now sensing they're going to work together. They're going to try to help bring peace among themselves and the world, and use their tremendous economic, political power for good means. Hmm. Uh, and and so uh, yes, I I uh, I think I knew what was going on. And I think I know what's been going on in this world in the last 10 years or so, particularly with our own country. Mm -hmm. I personally am extremely distressed about it and feel like we must learn that there is more to life and more to society than simply using military power to achieve some political end. There has to be something more than that. Okay. Um, so I presume that, that your idea of what was going on, well, I'm sure it changed somewhat, but uh, did, in what ways 
did it change or did you know did you kind of have an idea of what was going on the whole time it, it was slowly changing no i okay. didn't know oh yeah. no i had never been out in this world before yeah. and so I, I learned something about what was going on in japan and mm -hmm. and then one of the first things uh happened when i got back, got back my wife and i continued our studies in the first summer uh, we used up some savings. She had saved up some money from her cottage teaching. I had some saved up for service. We had to reach out and find out. So we joined other students from all across this country that farmed all kinds of study tours to Europe. Mm -hmm. So we spent 10 weeks in Europe uh, working with student groups in those countries, trying to find out their visions of a different world because they'd just been through it. They'd seen their countries destroyed. Mm -hmm. And it was a tremendously informative, awakening experience. Mm -hmm. And I gradually understood then more than I had before of what, what, why Europe had had its problems mm -hmm. and how it was changing. It was tremendously encouraging and tremendously uh, uh, invigorating uh, to me. We've, made, we've been back to Europe many times since, uh, professionally. Uh, and uh, I, I'm still enthralled with the tremendous change that has taken place in that part of the world within a matter of 50 to 60 years compared to what it had been throughout its history. Mm -hmm. That shows what can be done. Yeah. Human beings institutionally can bring about change if they are so inclined. What kind of things did you learn when you were um, like doing the educational uh, volunteering or whatever in, in Europe? Um, well, uh, learned rather quickly that students from Scotland, from France, from uh, from Austria, uh, we're all have similar feelings. Mm -hmm. We all have similar aspirations. Sure, we have different ethnic backgrounds. My background is German. Uh, all of my ancestors are German. Mm -hmm. They all were part of the German culture. They all left Germany because of their disaffection with what Germany had been doing uh, in, in their warlike, in, in, in their dictatorial ways. So as young people, all of my ancestors came to this country, made their own way, and began being a part of a different experiment in human history. So going over there, I began sensing that the young people in Germany were not like my ancestors had experienced. Mm -hmm. Things were different there too, but mm -hmm. they were still struggling very much. It was kind of interesting. I went to the, the meetings of their government, listened to them as they debated what kind of country do they want, mm -hmm. uh, what, what kind of future do they want, and it was going on in all those countries. And then rather quickly, there evolved a sense of communion among those countries. So at France and Germany and England particularly, so it didn't make any sense for us to keep fighting like we've been fighting throughout history. Mm -hmm. Why don't we figure out a way to resolve our differences? And so that was the beginning of the European Union, mm -hmm. which is now a fairly strong force politically, economically, and socially throughout the world. Uh, there's always going to be different groups. I mean, there's always going to be uh, German backgrounds, there's always going to be French, just like there's always going to be Illinois backgrounds and Wisconsin backgrounds, but you can still rise above that, that there's something called the human race that has similar aspirations, but you have to work together to get them. You cannot do it through only private aspir only through private seek seeking my own, mine and my, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're trying to sort that out now. Yeah. Uh, I spend a lot of my time in retirement, my wife does too, working with young groups in this community, wonderful young people that we could still work with, and trying to see as they are trying to put new ideals into their vision about the kind of country they want to be a part of. And we try to nourish it, encourage it, and mm -hmm. we get tremendously inspired. That's where the future is. Mm -hmm. uh, they recognize we're not going the right direction. Something's got to change. We cannot, we cannot continue to waste our resources. We cannot continue to plunder. We cannot continue to not provide for our own resources of education and health and infrastructure. And, and uh, we, we can't continue to do that. It's not, not, the, not the future. Mm -hmm. uh, so that it's that kind of a, a vision uh, that uh, has to be nourished and can be and is. Uh, and so we've gone through this in our lifetime of 84 years of, of depression, of 
the tremendous war, of the euphoria after the war, of some disillusionment now, but still quite optimistic. But the human being has to do something more than be concerned about their own personal welfare, uh, their own uh, goals, their own objectives, mm -hmm. and reach out to something beyond themselves. I agree. Um, let's see. And it's going, to, it's going to require a very effective, efficient uh, uh, kind of, of police force. The human beings are not necessarily uh, uh, innately going to just be for peace. We're going to have conflicts. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to figure out how to resolve the conflicts peacefully. That's what education can do. That's what our justice system do. And we've got to have a police force. We've got to have a military force to protect these things, but not mm -hmm. to encourage it, not, not to not to precipitate the very thing we're trying to stop. Mm -hmm. So I have tremendous respect for the military, for the police, for our justice system, mm -hmm. for our political leaders, and for tremendous respect for entrepreneurs who make our economic system work mm -hmm. for everybody, not just for their own greedy selves. Mm -hmm. The laboring group, the farmers, we all got something we could do if we learn that we are part of a community beyond ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, during the war, uh, did you write home often? Every day. Every day. Every day I would write, uh, and I can still remember, you know, the things I would say and I'd try to share. Uh, and then we would collect these, of course, of the whole crew, and then we'd get to shore, put them in bags, and later finally get back. And my wife would get a bunch of them a day, mm -hmm. and then we'd find our own bunch. And so I'd get a letter from her that was dated every day, uh, but being an oddball, uh, I wanted to I wanted that spread out. So I'd sort them, and I'd open one every day, mm -hmm. so that I'd have a new letter every day uh, while we we're uh, out out you know between between uh, engagements. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know we have some tremendous art in this country, and art one of the art farms of art, of course, is is uh, uh, the art of, of uh, movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had some tremendous movies. The two movies is that, that helped me re-understand Iwo Jima was, of course, Flags of Our Father mm -hmm. and, and uh, Letters from Iwo Jima. And I watched those and I relived. And, and I recognized while I was out there, and I recognized more since, you know, at the very same time I was writing to my dearest talking about how, you know, I thought we were doing a pretty good job, I thought we'd soon win, whatever. There were Japanese soldiers writing to their wives the very same way. Mm -hmm. They were over here. And to think about Niwa Jima, 20,000 young men were writing home knowing they'd never get out there alive. They still had to write home, they did. And some of those letters have been found. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you tell your loved one, I'm doing what is right, but I'll never see you again. No, I... and, 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 and art can do that. Uh, the mm -hmm. movies can do that. They've done a tremendous job, I think. Okay. Um, sp speaking of like movies that, and art that have uh, looked back at the war, uh, um, how, do you, how do you view the books and his historical accounts uh, and art and, and movies of World War II and the events surrounding uh, your experience, like the, the parts of the war that you were in? Uh, I'd give it a passing grade. I, th I, th okay. I, I think that uh, it's done a lot of good and obviously it's, it's been different, it's, it's been varied. And I think the extent to which the artist was trying to convey something very real and important Mm -hmm. Rather than something, gosh, I'm going to sell this and make a couple of million. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. There have been a lot of trash. Mm -hmm. A great deal is on the tube now is trash, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's pure entertainment and violent entertainment. It's sad. And a lot of, a lot of it's built around wars of one kind or another. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen some movies, Iwo Jima, I thought were useless. Um, it was all built up about pride and mm -hmm. patriotism and great heroic efforts of individuals rather than how sad and terrible it is. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think some of the movie goer, 
movie makers have gradually learned they can make a tremendous contribution, not to be the best movie of the, of the year. Mm -hmm. And it's about all parts of the war, not just Iwo Jima. Of course, mm -hmm. that's what uh, I, I recognize. Uh, and it's not just movies. I mean, I think artists, uh, our old Billy Mora Jackson mm -hmm. in this community, in, in his art, I think, helped us understand the human being and the, the relations of human being uh, that helped us all. Mm -hmm. art, art can do that. Have you gotten a chance to to see uh, any episodes of the of the Ken Burns the war? Uh, I've I've seen samples of them. I decided I did not uh, at this particular point because of other commitments that uh, my family has. I did not want to take that much time, so I've taped it all. Mm. But I've looked at parts of it. Okay. Uh, and I think he does a marvelous job. I liked his previous efforts. I like what PBS is doing for us. And we work hard to help it survive as one of the great institutions of our of our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think he, I think Ken Burns is a great artist. Mm -hmm. In the previous ones he's done about the Civil War and others, I wouldn't say that I agree with all he did, but he made make a choice. Mm -hmm. And I think the world would be better off having seen this. And I hope that that uh, that and I've seen a lot of people have seen it. A lot of my younger friends say, I didn't realize this. Is that what war is about? Mm -hmm. Tremendous, and, and I'll enjoy it when, if I ever get really retired, I'll probably sit down and look at every page of every, every minute of it. But I haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, going back to the letters that you were writing home, uh, did you describe, uh, it, like, did you describe what you were actually? Uh, experiencing in your letters or did you like did you make it more stomachable uh, most of it was personal most mm -hmm. of it was was reminiscing oh, okay. reminiscing with my parents and with my wife mm -hmm. uh, and, and talking about social interactions uh, uh, around the ship mm -hmm. uh, I would often try to characterize what physically was going on, but by law and by censorship, we had to be very careful on that. Mm -hmm. And we were in charge of the, of the troops, and I'll never forget the, the tragedy. <clears throat> we as officers had to censor every letter that went away from our crew, mm -hmm. and, and we had to just simply cut out parts. And I, I, I couldn't quite face up the fact that I would, I would release a letter from one of our crew members he was a little careless in what he said. He shouldn't have said some of the things because we were advised you simply cannot talk about the war. That's mm -hmm. illegal. And we had to take it out. And I wondered what his wife thought or his loved one to get a letter that half of it was cut out. Mm -hmm. uh, we as officers probably, having more control, were probably a little looser in what we did. Uh, but we would we would often say things that I'm sure left them an idea of where we were. We weren't supposed to tell them where we were, what we were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was mostly personal. It gave us a relief. Mm -hmm. uh, sit down and, and have pleasant thoughts and, and relief uh, from, from the goings on that was around. Okay. And reading it was even better, of course. Mm -hmm. um, how was it uh, for, how was it for your wife? Like, uh, how did you, how was your wife coping with the war? Well, I can only, uh, what I, I can only, uh, you know, uh, remember what she said, right. and we talked about it a great deal. Uh, she's always been a very uh, committed person. She decided at five years of age she wanted to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. She never relented from that. She was a great high school teacher, a great university teacher. Uh, great. Uh, she's known throughout the the world in her field, mm -hmm. and so uh, she was committed to that. And, and she started then by teaching high school while I was gone. She did a marvelous job, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and she would tell me about that. Uh, and she was, uh, you know, moving up through the ranks of, of great teachers uh, when I came back. And then um, she decided, as I did, we wanted to study more. Mm -hmm. So we went through graduate school essentially together. Uh, she had to interrupt hers long enough uh, to get our family started because we delayed that long enough. So. She was not about to turn over raising of kids to anybody else, so she stayed at home while our two kids were young. Uh, and and uh, when they got in the nursery school, immediately then she went back to school. She got her doctorate then, a little later than I did. Uh, and 
digress a moment. We got here in 1960. I had my doctorate. I had already been a professor at Tennessee, and I had an opening here. And she had her new doctorate, and she came to a campus that had nepotism. You know what nepotism means? Nepotism is a policy that grew up, uh, uh, certainly during the Depression, but maybe other places too. Nepotism means that, that uh, you cannot have more than one member of a family employed oh, okay. in some public agency, such as a university or a high school. Mm -hmm. And so we had a nepotism here in our statutes that are airtight. And our, the administration here at that time would not relent. No way will we change this because it, it's the very basis of survival or something, you know, some nonsensical thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, my wife uh, did not take that lightly. She was con convinced, she was qualified. And so when an opening came up, she applied for it. She came out of the top uh, ranking in the country. And so then her administrator at this university was able to take those uh, recommendations and go to our, our pro provost at the time and say, this is what you're doing by denying women uh, spouses the chance to, to be in the tenure rank, which mm -hmm. they couldn't be. We had, we had wonderful, educated women in the sciences and social sciences that spent 20 years being nothing more than just a, 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 a classroom teacher in sections, that not ever able to, to exercise the rights and privileges and responsibilities of a faculty member. Mm -hmm. So uh, her case was strong enough that they made a special case, uh, exception. We have a letter where back in 1962 she was granted an exception to this rule and so she was probably one of the first uh, tenured spouses appointed on this campus, which we're very proud, and, and she's proud. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it went on for another 10 years before we were able to get this changed. And as a faculty member, I was able to help bring about a change in this. And I can still remember the great day we took it to the Senate and finally got it proved that nepotism is not the way to go. So now we go out and hire couples. We, we, hire, we hire couples so that we can get the kind of talent we want. And a woman has almost the same rights as men, or obviously not quite but a lot different than it was back in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, so she coped by doing her job, being a very strong-willed person. During the summer when they weren't in class, she volunteered to go to the Pentagon. She, she was a typist. So she spent the summer typing. Before computers, mm -hmm. you type all orders, 16 pages, mm -hmm. with carbon copy. She was good at that. And so she helped win the war by working in the Pentagon uh, between her, her teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she's told me about those things. Okay. Um, what, what did you look forward to the most when you thought about coming home from the war? You mean other, obviously, other, other, than, other than joining my, family, yeah. my uh, wife yes, and, yeah. uh, and seeing my family again. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the second thing was getting back into education. Yeah. Again, getting the feel of being a student, of learning, of broadening the mind, because I had seen so much, I needed to, I needed to, to consolidate it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the travel to Europe helped us on that, uh, and uh, we both went on through to get our advanced degrees because that's the way we were getting some sense of what our worth was and how we might make a contribution. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, it, it was it was not a smooth path. I had many sleepless nights as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I, I wasn't as clear. She always wanted to be a teacher, period. You have to worry about it. But mm -hmm. My life was not quite that clear, so it took me a long time. Yeah. And I've learned that in my own children as they've searched and struggled. Yeah, I went through that too at one time. Okay. Uh, this is tape two of a veteran interview with Bob Spitzy. Uh, from Urbana, Illinois, for the Veterans History Project uh, in Campbell Hall Studio X, uh, WILL TV, October 9th, 2007. That's a lot of information. Um, after the war was over, was it possible for you to put it behind you completely? Um, obviously, you kind of explained this already, but. I suspect it was possible. I didn't need to, okay. and I didn't want to. Okay. Uh, I, I think there must have been some experiences, many experiences of, of veterans that they simply did not want to stay in that frame of mind, even think about it. Right. And I'm saddened by that, because I think 
that, that, that it was something that they have to get out at some point and probably are still. Maybe this will help some. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like I could talk about it. I haven't, I haven't spent a great deal of time. My family often had to bait me a bit because it, it wasn't something I just wanted to spread the word. But I, I was not uh, apologetic for it. I was not embarrassed by it. I was not uh, ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. But it was just a part of experience that had been a tremendously important part of my life. And now I was ready to go ahead. Um, have you continued to like participate in um, like reunions or um, like the American Legion or, or things like that? that no, uh, I haven't. Okay. Um, I have no objection to people who want to continue that, mm -hmm. <coughs> but. Uh, that was not an experience that I think is so great that you just want to keep on living it right. and, and you don't want to keep on fetching it, mm -hmm. perpetuating it. I think we need a military and I'm proud of people who have chosen that and who want to, but I hope they don't glorify that to the extent of everything else either. Right. To me, uh, social interaction is much more productive on issues having to do with the community, having to do with the problems we have, mm -hmm. having to do with the ways that we could move ahead. And whereas a great deal of military uh, uh, <coughs> uh, camaraderie has been kind of perpetuating that by itself. And that uh, I, didn't, I didn't particularly want. If some people want it, that's up to them, but I didn't. Okay. Um. Uh, what, let's see, um, this is a more of a <coughs> qualitative question, um, but what about your experience uh, and that of others in, in similar like positions to, uh, in the war to, um, to you, uh, was, what do you think? was significant is significant or important uh, about that experience to our understanding of war today our understanding of the <laughs> war today i i think the the interaction i've had with other veterans mm -hmm. which can be both casual it can be fairly serious and i i have welcomed that and i've engaged in that uh, but it's been uh, uh casual and it has been uh is not not been persistent, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as I have talked to some of my colleagues who are in the, in the ground war side, mm -hmm. I sense that they they had something different than I did mm -hmm. that shaped their experience and shaped their uh, their and and I'm glad I learned that mm -hmm. in the air. I lost one of my strongest relatives, a, a cousin I grew up with. He was an airman and uh, he was lost. And I, I think about that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. What a tremendous loss there was to society with, with his loss, uh, just simply because of happenstance. And I'm sorry about that. And, and that can be multiplied by thousands and thousands, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so w war is not something I dwell on I dwell on conflict, which is so real around us all the time, mm -hmm. and and professionally and personally, I, I strive continuously to figure out how it is that I can help be a part of a society that learns to be different, but resolve its problems without violence. And that surely has to be the, the, the ultimate objective of, of a human being. Mm -hmm. I have a couple other questions, but I think you've kind of answered them. Um, uh, okay, okay, I could ask, uh, what do you think people today should know about what you personally went through? Um, other than, I'm, I'm not sure my personal experience is, is particularly valuable. Right. I think that the people today need to understand what war is. Yeah what can be accomplished by it and what cannot be accomplished by it. Mm -hmm. 
and what it means to the individuals who are involved. People, I think, must understand that. Just the same as they must understand how the banking system works, uh, how, how uh, uh, a job works, how a skilled craftsman or a professor or a doctor or lawyer, they need to understand these things. And in that sense, I think that uh, they need to, to understand what being in the war, but the same way they need to understand what it's like being a police officer. I often think a police officer is engaged in what I engaged in four years of my life, they engage in it their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I try to understand that, and I try to respect that. And I try to say, but they have responsibilities. They only have a limited role, just like I had a limited role. Uh, and, and so I, I think it, we should never cease to reach out to understand others who are different from me. And since everybody's different, then we're continually trying to understand people who believe differently, who have different religions, who have different philosophies of life, who have different occupations, understand and gain something from that and give something to it so that we can all live peacefully on this little hunk of, of cosmos floating around in the universe. We can live more peacefully and enjoyably, and it is possible. It just has to be. And I'm sort of a, an idealist, I suppose, in that respect, but I've seen enough in my education, I've seen enough results of it. The wonderful students I've had through many, many years, I see what they got, what they've done, and then I know people who didn't do it, and I feel tremendous loss at a few students that somehow I think I must have failed. Uh, they lost their lives, usually by self-indulgence some way. And somehow I must have failed some way in them. But most of my memories are positive, and I see the tremendous, the tremendous thing of the species we call the human beings among a natural world. We're very different by chance, I think, through the evolutionary processes, which I happen to believe is, is fairly strong force. <clears throat> and so we can do things that others cannot do in this world. They can do things we can't do. And there's no reason that we can't somehow be compatible with the natural world around us. And part of that natural world is people. So let's figure out how we can be compatible with other human beings and still be different because we're different. I'm different from my wife, thank goodness. I'm different from my neighbor. I'm different from my brother. That's the way it should be. But we can still respect and enjoy being on the same planet and get along with each other. Okay. Um, well, that's all I had. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's been an enjoyable afternoon yeah. spending with you. I, I concur. <laughs>